Hi, it's Lindsay Labonte, Branch Manager at Applied Mortgage. We're here on the Applied Mortgage Community Show, and on this episode, I have a special guest, perfect time of year, Brandon O'Donnell, our local CPA here, to tell us a little bit about some questions we all have about filing our tax returns and when we need to involve an accountant. Uh, so, Brandon, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your firm? Sure. Thanks, Lindsay. Thanks for having me here today. Um, I'm Brandon O'Donnell. I grew up in East Stampton and uh, live there right now with my wife. We purchased a home there in 2017. And I'm a CPA at Boisel Morton Wolkowitz, which is a full service CPA firm in Hadley. And we provide tax, financial statement, and consulting services to local businesses nonprofits and individuals. Awesome. And uh, about how, how long have you been there or in the field in general? Yeah, I've been in the field about 12 years. And, uh, you know, every tax season is different with the never ending changes to regulation. So it, it keeps us keeps us on our toes. Yeah, definitely. I know the feeling, right? But we always say in the mortgage world, the one constant is change because the guidelines are just constantly changing. Not to mention everybody's financial situation is different too. Um, so for somebody who maybe files their taxes on their own or does all their own bookkeeping or whatever, could you just tell us, I mean, what what's a CPA? What does that even stand for? And and what's the difference between maybe a CPA, an accountant, a bookkeeper? What do sure. those mean? Yeah. So CPA stands for Certified Public Accountant. And that that the difference between a CPA and a, an accountant or bookkeeper is generally related to being licensed under the state that you're working out of. So I'm licensed in Massachusetts as a certified public accountant. We're required to have a certain amount of continuing ed hours, pass a test, um, and maintain a co or stand by a code of ethics. So, and uh, another big difference between CPAs and accountants is that we're allowed to provide a test services, which means we can issue financial statements on behalf of banks and nonprofits for um, investors and regulatory agencies. Okay, so if somebody's maybe an accountant or a bookkeeper, it doesn't necessarily mean that they can actually do somebody's taxes. You'd want to be a. Yeah, you know, it varies in the complexity. I mean, there's just because somebody is a CPA doesn't mean that they even do taxes. Most of us do, um, but it really comes down to the person's experience levels and uh, what their background is. Awesome. And so uh, if somebody isn't using a, a CPA at all in their life. I mean, when's kind of the right time to start or, or when should you maybe stop trying to do your tax returns on your own? Yeah, I think it really starts when all those major life events happen. You know, we people get married, have children, they're buying a home for the first time or second time, maybe purchasing a rental property um, or starting a business. So those are the big times when people reach out to us for guidance on how that's going to impact their taxes and also just for short-term and long-term planning right so probably the sooner the better it's it's always like that you maybe don't reach out till you need help and you're stuck but partnering with the right cpa earlier is probably helpful um and what are the most common ways that you help people better their financial or maybe specifically their tax situation sure you know i think the biggest thing is that we do our best to stay on top of all the changing legislation and I think a great example of that is, you know, since the pandemic started, there's been a lot of stimulus and grants um, and loans available to small businesses and to some individuals. You know, we helped our clients, you know, get through that and try to get the most out of their um, opportunities. And a good example of that was the Paycheck Protection Program. We helped our clients as a kind of a go-between from them and the banks to make sure that they were getting the money that they were entitled to. So. And another way we help our clients is coordinating with their investment advisors. So, you know, we try to look at it as a holistic, you know, planning for retirement, saving for their kids' college funds, and just to make sure they're on the way of meeting their goals financially, personally. We just try to give them any guidance we can to help them move along. So you really have an integrated approach to looking at all facets of their kind of financial picture and helping to guide people in the right direction. That sounds really important and definitely a reason to use a CPA sooner rather than later. Um, so 
you know, being a mortgage professional, the questions that I receive all the time as it pertains to taxes are, are mortgage related. So especially this time of year, people are asking, what do I need to give my tax preparer to do my tax returns? Um, what is tax deductible as far as, you know, mortgages are concerned? Um, could you talk a little bit about, and, and it's going to be different for everybody's situation, right? But maybe just the typical homeowner that owns their own house or maybe another property, um, what kind of information are you looking at there? Yeah, the, the most common document, you know, your company would provide anybody that has a loan with you is a form 1098. And that form is going to detail the amount of interest that they paid in the prior year, which will be needed for their tax return. It'll also show um, any mortgage insurance or points that were paid. And it's often too that if real estate taxes and the um, homeowner's insurance is paid out of escrow, it will be disclosed on that form. So that's a really important form, form 1098, to make sure you give to your person helping with your taxes. Also, in a year when you purchase, refinance, um, or sell a home, it's really it's a good idea to give your accountant the closing document from the attorney so they can evaluate that to look for any other tax write-offs that are included. On the mortgage interest side, depending on whether the home is a primary residence, a second home, or a rental home, it will change how the interest is deducted. If you have a rental property, the interest is deducted directly off of the rental income, whereas on your primary residence, it's deducted as part of itemized deductions as a whole. And so an example of other itemized deductions could be real estate taxes that were paid, charitable donations that you made, some medical expenses, and then we throw in the mortgage interest as well. And so that will be deducted on your personal tax return against your wages and other income that you have. Okay, that makes sense. Whereas the rental property might be on your a different schedule or a business return if it's owned by a corporation or, or what have you. Exactly. Um, what about mortgage insurance? Somebody asked me this the other day. If, if they're paying mortgage insurance, um, which sometimes is financed into the loan, sometimes it's monthly, is that something that can be deducted in any way? Yeah, the good news was they extended it. Originally, um, it was set to expire the, the deduction for a PMI. And for 2021, you are allowed to still deduct PMI. But as you make, as a household makes more than $100,000, that deduction will start to phase out. So um, it will depend on your income levels, whether you can actually deduct that PMI payment. That makes sense. And another big question I receive all the time, when somebody's getting a gift to buy a house from a family member, how is that taxable or is it even taxable? Yeah, and that, that's a that's a great thing to do, especially parents or grandparents trying to help um, people buy their first home. Um, so if you received a gift, it's not taxable income to the recipient. And depending on the amount, there could be a reporting uh, mechanism needed with the IRS. You know, they refer to that as a gift tax return. And for 2021, that limit threshold is $15,000. So if a grandparent um, gave a grandkid $50,000 um, as a down payment on a home, the grandparent would have to file a gift tax return with the IRS because it's over 15 grand. And the, the term gift tax return can be a little misleading because it's an, generally it's an informational filing with the IRS just to notify them of the, the transfer of wealth from one generation to another. But in that example, it wouldn't create any taxable event for either um, either parties there. So it would be a tax free exchange. OK, and, and then it's not taxed until they hit the lifetime exemption, which um, do you know roughly what that is right now? No, it yeah, it's right, yeah, it does change every year and it's right around 12 million dollars. So um, in that example, it would lower the exemption from 12 million and it would reduce that by $50,000. $50, okay. Yep. So they'd have a while before they hit that 12 million, 12 million. Yes. Yep. Maybe a lot of room there. <laughs> um, these are great, great scenarios. Thank you for these answers. One other one that comes up a lot, especially now, a lot of people are doing situational refinances to take advantage of the equity that everyone's accumulated with home prices appreciating so much. So they're maybe doing a cash out refinance, tapping into some of that equity, using it for other things. Um, so people always ask when they 
take that cash out, I mean, sometimes it can be fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars. Do they have to claim that as income? No, great question. Yeah, it's not considered income since it's equity you've in your own home. And so that equity can be taken out tax free. It's your money to do what you want with. When it comes to the interest side of it, though, you're only allowed to deduct mortgage interest if it's related to purchase or remodel or improve your home. So, you know, if you did take out a home equity loan, say for $30,000 and I mean, I'm sorry, a refinance, cash out refinance with $30,000 there. And if you used it to pay off personal credit card expenses or maybe pay off a car loan, that portion of your mortgage, we'd have to take that and then look at how much interest was uh, paid during the year. And that would just be non-deductible interest, but you wouldn't be taxed on the money you took out. Great to know. I'm learning a lot in this conversation. That's awesome. Um, so kind of just for some general changes that have happened uh, for the 2021 tax year, what are some important tax changes that, that you want to highlight for us here? Sure. Yeah. And we've had a lot of those in recent years. There was a major tax uh, reform in 2018. And since the pandemic has started, I can't even count how many different pieces of legislation have come through that have affected you know, taxes and stimulus and grants. Um, I think for 2021, a few that we should highlight is related to the expansion of the child tax credit. And so for 2021, the child tax credit was expanded from $2,000 per dependent up to $3,600 per dependent, depending on their age. Um, it's great because people will be getting more money in certain circumstances. The other side of it is the IRS started sending out some of these increases in child tax credits over the summer. So some people received six monthly payments. So it means you already got some of your refund in some cases. So some people might be a little disappointed at tax time when their refunds are a little smaller than they were hoping, but they did already get the money in some scenarios. Um, another provision that changed for 2021 was related to unemployment. You know, it's, it's been tough times for some people. And in 2020, um, the IRS did allow the first $10,200 of unemployment to be non-taxable. Unfortunately, for the 2021 year, that provision was repealed and all unemployment will be fully taxable for the 2021 tax year under current law. And another item as you're getting your tax documents ready for your account and your CPA is they're going to need to know the amount of the stimulus payments, the $1,400 third round stimulus payment. Most people receive theirs in March of 2021. And depending on income levels, if you weren't able to get your um, stimulus payment last year, you might be able to claim that as a refundable tax credit on your 2021 tax return. Another item um, that has changed is uh, student loan forgiveness. Um, the, it used to be a taxable event. So if I had $10,000 of student loans that were forgiven, I would have to pay tax on that. This was changed. So for 2021, anybody that did receive student loan uh, forgiveness, that's going to be a non-taxable benefit for them. Wow. Yeah. And another item just to bring up, because I know you're involved in some local charitable organizations, the IRS was really trying to stimulate gifts to charities. So they were allowing everybody, even if you don't itemize, you can deduct up to $300 to your local charitable organization um, for 2021. Now, this is going to have to be a cash donation. But if you're married, you can do up to $600. And this will be regardless if you itemize or not. So, you know, make sure you provide your accountant with um, your charitable donations in 2021, even if you don't think you're going to have to itemize. Awesome. That's some great information. Some seems for the better, some for the worse, but I think it just all points to the more reason to be using a professional and helping you navigate all of these changes, especially over the last couple of years with all the pandemic relief programs and stimulus and everything else that's going on. Thanks for outlining those. I have to throw yeah. one last zinger at you and ask the question everybody's been wondering about i got a group text over here with my family saying stop using venmo so what's the deal with venmo and uh getting taxed for transfers and payments back and forth on venmo yeah i've been hearing a lot of that as well and i you know definitely on social media and some of the news been seeing some of those headlines 
So beginning in 2022, there's been a big change for 1099 reporting. And so, you know, previously these US based peer to peer um, networks, they only had to report transactions to people if they had $20,000 or more in a given year. And so that has recently been reduced down to 600, which is the same threshold that we would use for um, paying a contractor or submitting um, rental expenses and rental income. So the IRS lowered it down to 600, which will now have a lot of people receiving 1099s that never did. One really big point to emphasize is that the, the $600 threshold only has to deal with goods and services. So when you're in Venmo or PayPal, you select whether you're going to be sending the money to somebody for goods or services or for family and friends. And so the family or friends side of things will not be reported on 1099. So, so you know, if you paid an electrician to come to your home, maybe paid them $1,000 for some repairs through Venmo, that will be reported as a 1099 transaction. That electrician will receive a 1099 showing that you paid that amount of money. But if you transfer a friend, you know, six, seven hundred dollars, maybe as a loan, that will not be reported and it will not be taxable to that person. So it'll be situational, but it's definitely going to cause a lot of confusion and create a lot of most likely unnecessary tax notices, too, in the following year. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of extra tracking, and I'm sure you're going to be getting a lot of questions about it as well. But but so to be clear, that's actually for 2022. So when you file for next year's, not for this year's taxes. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. So it begins the calendar okay. year 2022 is this new reporting threshold. For 2021, it was still the $20,000. Uh, okay. Threshold. So so we can use Venmo this year. We just have to track what's friends and family versus what's actually payment for goods and services. And then people are going to be just sending you a whole big list of things when you do their taxes. <laughs> yeah, it keeps getting bigger. That's helpful. That's really great. Well, this has been awesome information. I really appreciate your time. I learned a lot today. So thank you, Brandon. And um, yeah, it was great to have you. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Awesome. We'll talk to you soon. That's a wrap. Thanks so much for tuning in to our Applied Mortgage Community Show. As always, if you have any mortgage-related questions, please contact our team at Applied Mortgage, 413-586-5626 or appliedmortgageteam.com. And if you wanna be featured on one of our episodes, let me know, we'd love to have you.